you're listening to Conferences Online Allergy, new fellow orientation series from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 26, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, atopic dermatitis. Our presenter is Dr. Luce Vanassier. She's the Chief and Program Director of Allergy Immunology at Winthrop University Hospital in Mineola, New York. University Medical Center in Long Island, New York. Uh, you're right in the uh, in the eye of the hurricane. Is coming your way, isn't yes, it? Yes, we are getting ready. Are you get boarding up your windows and preparing? <laughs> we're, uh, we're evacuating some people. And you're yeah, taking and a little bit of time off to talk with us about atopic of dermatitis. Course. We we really appreciate it as you're getting your preparations in order. Uh, Dr. Finasier has uh, sp- spoken to us before on contact dermatitis, atopic dermatitis. Um, she has the, the grossest slides, but uh, we'll, we'll handle that. <laughs> okay, anyway, do, um, I, do, you, do I use your slides and then can I and so uh, you, move I have your slides. So I'll, be able, yeah. I'll go ahead and make uh, slides available. And uh, if you use your mouse, let's see, yes. uh, I can give you control of the keyboard and the mouse. And that way you can just move your mouse around and you can control the slides. So do I just advance it with this? Okay. You've got it. So I'm welcome doing it, right? To, okay, yes. thank you. Welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Uh, Finacio. Thank you. It's a great, this is a, like a very uh, interesting and uh, close to my heart topic. Uh, and I think because this is mostly for fellows preparation, I did a little bit of basics and more or less the nuts and bolts of what you uh, are going to see for difficult uh, atopic dermatitis patients. So we would like to identify, of course, get the differential diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, uh, discuss the workup, understand the treatment, and discuss some of the new or controversial treatments uh, for atopic dermatitis. I get a lot of questions on probiotics and vitamin D, and I'd like to just give you a little bit of a summary of what's out there in literature. For those of you who are taking the boards, I think, um, uh, the important uh, questions are what do you find in the acute uh, atopic dermatitis skin and what do you find in the chronic atopic dermatitis skin. So uh, immunologic immune responses, uh, we know that, uh, oops, all right, we're good. Um, but you have your Th2 predominant responses in the acute lesions, and uh, you would have your uh, Langerhans cells, uh, which hyperstimulate your T cell, and you would have dysregulation of your uh, phosphodiesterase and excessive T cell activation to antigens, which are food and then environmentals. And of course, you have your IgE mechanisms involved in the acute responses. Once you go into the chronic responses, you see uh, PH1 responses here, such as interferon. But you also have non-immunologic mechanisms, uh, which uh, is uh, getting more prominent now, including the itch scratch cycle. And you have irritants, such as solvents, uh, wool, and uh, perspiration. I think it's all right. So um, the, more and more, we realize that uh, the, a defect in skin barrier in atopic dermatitis uh, is uh, um, influencing the severity of the disease. And the loss of function or null mutation in gene encoding the filaggrin is strongly associated with the development of asthma in patients with atopic dermatitis. And these two mutations are associated with atopic dermatitis in less than a third of European Americans, suggesting that there are other additional mechanisms and that the genetic variants of that and the genetic variants of filaggrin are absent or extremely rare in African-American and Asian patients. So what is this filaggrin? So filaggrin is filament aggregating protein. It binds to and is responsible for keratin aggregation. You see here the yellow ones are the filaggrin. And uh, the, the younger cells, the cells in the basal areas of the epidermis, uh, have this filaggrin that's uh, shooting up here. Now, 
uh, what does tulagrin do? It will induce the cytoskeleton to collapse, and it will then form a very flat cornified layer, so that your corneocytes, as you go up into the epidermis, and you will see here that the corneocytes will then be heavily cross-linked, and you will see the cornified cell envelope. This is very critical for an effective skin barrier. This is de de decreases the water loss of the skin, and it decreases the entry of irritants in the area as well. So as you see, you have your control animals, very nice, regular scales, very well organized. And mutants with filagrin uh, mutation have these very disorganized, disquamating scales. And on uh, staining, the normal skin with a normal skin barrier have filagrin granules uh, that prevent all of this disorganization. And you will see an ichthyosis, vulgaris, or atopic dermatitis skin, which does not have the filagrin granules. So the concepts are evolving that the pathogenesis of uh, atopic dermatitis and eczemas are not only immunologic, but also of uh, skin barrier dysfunction. And this skin barrier dysfunction actually enhances allergen sensitization and leads to systemic allergic responses. It decreases IgE and even airway hypersensitivity. So we're switching from the immunologic to epidermal barrier mechanism that underlie atopic dermatitis. And most likely, it's a combination of these two. But what's important is that we think that it may predispose to uh, the development of the atopic march. So you see this patient come to your office. What do our fellows do when they see these patients uh, walk in? They pull out this sheet, which you can um, uh, reproduce in your own offices, of uh, what's the work of, for intractable atopic dermatitis. We look at the general principles. Are the patients doing this? You have general skin care. Are the patients bathing? Are they using moisturizers? Are they compliant with your advice? Are, how, what is the impact in quality of life, the difficulty of sleeping? Uh, and a lot of psychosocial. We have parents and children arguing, uh, conflicts of uh, their relationship. Are the children in daycare or school programs? Uh, are there marital problems that can increase the itch perception of the child? Um, all of these are uh, important in the evaluation of an atopic dermatitis patient. And then what we all know how to do is to evaluate for hypersensitivity. Uh, when was solid food introduced? Is the baby breastfed? Uh, evaluate for food hypersensitivity. You can do a panel of a small panel of skin testing in the very young, egg, milk, soy, wheat, uh, peanut in the little bit older child. As there is some history of food sensitivity, error allergens, carpeting, bedding, pets. Of course, dust mite is very important, and contact allergens. Don't forget that contact allergy is not infrequent, even though it's uh, as important uh, in atopic dermatitis patients. Uh, it, the medications that you're putting on, like the steroids and moisturizers, can actually be sensitizers. Uh, there, as if the patient has a known contact allergen, very often lanolin can be a, a, a irritant and a sensitizer. And, and interesting, you have a lanolin paradox where in um, normal looking skin, you won't have as much irritation. But in atopic dermatitis skin, the lanolin would play a more irritant role. You have infectious causes as well. You see these honey colored crust, uh, pustules, weeping. Uh, consider nasal culture. Consider skin culture. You most likely 90% get staph. Uh, Empiric antibiotics, we tend to give intranasal bactroban uh, in patients who are colonized and topical bactroban as well. You see this complication as well. Child comes in, fever, lymphadenopathy, vesicles, and erosions together with severe atopic exacerbation. Consider a trunk smear culture and, e and giving the child a cyclovir. You get a scaly rash or a nail changes. Consider KOH smear and fungal culture and start an antifungal medication, topically or orally. Uh, this is, uh, again, a, a 
rather relatively new concept where Malasi Sharp Eaters Forums in Pondialis is common in the seborrheic area. You, uh, these patients have a high IgE against this organism, this fungal organism, uh, mostly in the head and neck distribution. And if you treat it with antifungal agents, the severity of atopic dermatitis decreases. Now, this, in the very young child, you need to differentiate uh, eczema from immunodeficiency as against just a severe atopic dermatitis. And so, Wiscott Aldrich, hyper IgE, Netherton's chronic granulomatous disease, HDLD, and HIV infections need to be considered. And in adults, mycosis fungoides need to be considered. This is part of a checklist, so if you just want to download um, the slides that I gave you and uh, tailor it to your uh, institution, it's a good checklist. Once you suspect something, is go get your uh, laboratory tests uh, to screen for them. So you have here, for example, a two-year-old boy who was brought in for pneumonia. He did have a history of intracranial bleed, epistaxis, bloody diarrhea. The kid had a failure to thrive. And you see this uh, petechial uh, rash and uh, eczematous lesions in the face and in the uh, in the face and in the flexural areas. Uh, platelets is low. There is an increase of bleeding time and the uh, increase of IgA and IgE, low IgM and normal IgG. So. When you are presented with a kid like this, you want to obviously look at the platelets and will be considering Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Now, uh, this six-year-old girl came with a very pyritic eczematous dermatitis on the face. In the, uh, look at the uh, perioral area, the arms. In the back, uh, this child uh, has diarrhea, failure to thrive. This child is very atopic, so atopic dermatitis certainly is very going to be very high in your consideration. Peanut allergy, uh, both parents have atopic dermatitis. With this child, you want to take a strand of hair, and the examination of the hair will show you this uh, bamboo hair. Uh, here, uh, making your diagnosis of Netherton syndrome. Netherton is a rare autosomal recessive genodermatosis. Uh, it, patients will be atopic, but it's more than that. They have immunologic abnormalities, transient neutrophil defects. They'll have an impaired cellular immune responses and elevated complements in some. Now, when you have an older patient, like this patient of ours, 61-year-old, actually referred by an allergist to me for a patch testing, uh, had a five-year duration of pyritic eczema. There is no family history of atopy. This is a recent onset eczema. Uh, she's discontinued all her medications because they thought it might be drug eruption. She's tried topical uh, corticosteroids. It minimally helped, uh, but she continued to have the rash, and for these patients, a skin biopsy will help in your diagnosis of a possible cutaneous T-cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides. And in mycosis fungoides, you have different stages. You have the patch stage, which is probably the one that's the biggest differential diagnosis for your atopic dermatitis. But one characteristic of your patches is if you look at this, you have like the thin, wrinkled quality, and some even reticulated, like little blood vessel-like uh, the pruritus is minimal or absent, um, and unfortunately, mycosis uh, fungoides, uh, it may precede mycosis fungoides diagnosis by years. For such patients, you may do two or three biopsies. Um, maybe there's a, generally a delay of six months. This patient had received about at least 10 biopsies with a gene rearrangement that was initially negative. This patient has gone to Cornell, to NYU, uh, to four, five different institutions. And it was just a matter of time that uh, the mycosis fungoides by histology had appeared. But you can also have a plaque stage, which can still be uh, considered as a differential diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. And then your tumor stage, which is more uh, the dermatologist's uh, uh, diagnosis. So 
when you have and you have a major diagnosis that it is atopic dermatitis, you have ruled out immune deficiencies uh, and other causes. What are the principles of therapy for your patient? Um, general supportive care is important. You want to get the disease under control, and you want to keep it under control. So, how what are the supportive therapy? Supportive therapy is skin hydration and barrier therapy, even with a lot of medications. This is still the most important uh, 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 concept you have to tell your patients or their uh, caregivers is that regardless of the amount of topical corticosteroids that you're giving in, skin hydration, barrier therapy, emollients, baths, sweat traps, avoiding irritants, more of skin care is the most important. Then you get, get your disease under control by giving them anti-inflammatory medications. Again, depending on the strength of the um, uh, corticosteroids, uh, on the disease severity, and stronger steroids for shorter bursts. Keeping under control steroid sparing agents, including your immunomodulators. Uh, these um, medications are pretty expensive uh, immunodevices. I call them glorified. Uh, uh, moisturizers, and then uh, more in Europe, but we are definitely using a lot of proactive treatment now, and I will discuss this later on. So let's go with the uh, skin barrier. What are the uh, what's important with skin barriers? Emollients improve skin barrier function. It reduces susceptibility to irritants, and adding emollient strengthens by delaying intercellular filaggrin and coiling. So it does have some uh, chemical effect. I think what's important to also realize that although topical corticosteroids help, they can inhibit epidermal fatty acid synthesis and disrupt barrier function. And therefore, although they work, you must have a regular use of appropriate emollients and try to decrease as much as possible the use of topical corticosteroids. What are the ingredients, ingredients contributing to effective moisturizers? Glycerol is a humectant. It attracts and holds water in the skin. Now, your petrolatum is an occlusive. It will retard evaporation, but it does not supply the water, meaning you have to make sure that it is applied on wet skin because it's not very useful if you applied it on dry, on dry skin. And then you have your lanolins, which are emollients, which will lubricate your stratum corneum. The effectiveness of your basic therapy is directly linked to the patient adherence. And therefore, do not disregard the fact that your uh, adolescent, teenager, uh, uh, male patient will not apply a glycerin or a Vaseline before going to school because it's shiny and it's very unattractive. You have to uh, have a cosmetic acceptance of the moisturizer. Mm. What about baths? Baths, uh, we ha I recommend two types of baths. Once a week, I have at least a soaking bath for 20 minutes with or without oatmeal or baking, uh, baking soda. Have the patient quickly clean with uh, mild wash or the rest of the week, six days in a week. It's a quick five-minute bath. Drip dry, apply occlusive emollient immediately. In both types of baths, drip dry, minimal drying, and within five minutes, the emollients have to be applied. What soaps can you recommend? You can use, uh, I tend to recommend very mild soaps and cleansers, Vaniderm, Dove, Basis, Neutrogena, Vino, Purpose, Cetaphil. They're pretty good soaps. There are antibacterial soaps such as chlorhexidine with chlorhexidine and triclosan. Remember, you cannot really use it for long periods of time. Uh, there is some toxicity uh, in the use of these uh, medications, and there are probably a few indications for it, uh, maybe for a short-term uh, period of time. For the detergents to wash your clothes, we would recommend liquid rather than powder, again, because the liquid leaves less, has less chances of leaving a residue uh, that might irritate the skin and always add a second rinse cycle. There is, to date, only one really double-blind placebo-controlled challenge on the use of bleach baths, and this is um, 
uh, 31 atopic dermatitis patients. Uh, they initially eliminated st uh, staph aureus by giving the patient cephalexin for 14 days. Then one group was given an international mopiramycin five days a month and uh, your bleach bath or sodium hypochlorite twice a week for three months. The other group, uh, the control group, was given petrolatum ointment in the nose and plain water bath twice weekly for three months. You will see here in the study that the easy scores reduced after one month compared to in, in patients with uh, the sodium hypochlorite control uh, compared to the placebo. However, in this study, only the body parts that are submerged during the bathing with uh, sodium hypochlorite actually improved and the head and neck area is not. So they're kind of looking at this study again using wet cloths also on the uh, face and on the forehead while the body is submerged. And it's really unclear whether clinical effect of bleach bath can be explained solely by the staph aureus reduction or astringent effects of the bleach bath or both. Dr. Thanasier, does swimming help if they go to the swimming pool on a regular basis during the summer? The swimming is enough to hydrate, but remember you have very high chlorine levels in the uh, swimming pool, so you will have to, uh, that is actually an equivalent of a of, um, uh, bleach bath too, but you need to wash it off after very quickly, uh, wash completely with your mild mild soap. Because it'll also, be an it would be an sorry? irritant otherwise, right? It, there would be an irritant, yes. Okay. <laughs> What about wet traps? Again, uh, what is it? Wet traps are reserved for acute intervention. And in a child like this, you probably have to admit the patient. I have been successful with wet traps if I cycle it. In other words, uh, I tell them the, the two arms uh, during the week, uh, one week, and then the leg, especially if it's generalized, uh, wet traps on the arms for five days, wet traps on the legs, cycle it because it's really impossible to get a person with wet traps in the whole body. It's extremely uncomfortable. Um, what it is is you apply the, either an emollient or steroids in two layers of rolled gauze or, or uh, tube socks. The first one is wet and the second one is dry. There are benefits where you have a barrier to scratching and it increases steroid penetration if you do apply steroids. It does allow rapid healing of excoriated lesions and it decreases stuff or its colonization. A big, big drawback is it's very um, uh, difficult to do. It's very uncomfortable. So as I said, either cycle it or maybe just a five-day period during um, as an acute intervention, you might be able to convince your patients to do it. Now, this is an interesting study looking at what about uh, using the topical corticosteroids as against steroids alone without a wet wrap. And you will see that there is a significant improvement in patients who had used uh, topical corticosteroids with wet wrap, so the steroids and then your uh, wet rolled gauze compared to topical corticosteroids alone. Liz, how long do you keep the wet wraps on for? Overnight. Hmm. So before they go to bed, they put it on, they take it off the next morning. Hmm. Uh, topical uh, antibiotic is used for localized impetigenized lesion, and systemic antibiotics are really more practical for extensive skin uh, infections. And um, it, uh, it's also used to treat nasal carriage. Anti-inflammatory alone with topical corticosteroids and our, uh, topical carcinoma inhibitors has actually improved atopic dermatitis and reduced staph colonization uh, e even without the use of topical corticosteroids. So just improving that atopic dermatitis skin, even without antibiotic, will reduce colonization. What antibiotics can you use? Uh, avert infections, uh, need antibiotics like this child or when you see something like that, when you see super infections. Uh, and you can use antibiotics such as uh, cefadroxyl, cefalexin, uh, tetracycline for the older child, and uh, trimetrin, sulfamethoxazole. There's been uh, uh, use of uh, probably like uh, your uh, uh, your Levaquin uh, for like the older uh, patients. 
I like this again also as an acute measure it, um, for oozing and weeping lesions in localized areas. You can prescribe domiboral astringent. Uh, you put it in a gauze or, or in a face towel. Uh, you soak it in domiboral with water. It's an aluminum acetate and leave it as a compress just for a few hours, like uh, about an hour and then you can wash it off. It takes off a lot of crusting and uh, it, it's, it's rather soothing. What are the new strategies for the use of topical corticosteroids? Uh, we always prescribe it twice a day, but uh, there are some data that shows that using it once a day will actually increase compliance, and this has been done with fluticasone and mametasone. So it is effective once a day. Another issue is uh, the use of topical of steroids in children. It has been shown that up to a period of one month in this study, um, in children over three months, uh, the use of regular uh, topical corticosteroids daily uh, it should be shown to be safe and effective in these children. So that's reassuring. And uh, patients as young as three months shown that long-term maintenance twice a week is actually safe and effective. And I will show you the proactive treatment that, that uses this fluticasone twice a week for extended periods of time. The limitations we know are atrophy, as you see here. When you see a patient with this it, and you stop the topical corticosteroids, you, it, this is a reversible stage, okay? So you, you have to follow up children on topical corticosteroids on a regular basis to catch atrophy and catch the side effects of topical corticosteroids. Telangiectasia, also still in the, limit, uh, in the reversible stage. Dispigmentation, Early on, maybe, but later on, you will see a lot of children with hyper or hypopigmentation, perioral oral dermatitis. Your three A, as you know, you reach this point. It is now um, irreversible. Uh, but what would not have those side effects would be the topical carcinoma inhibitors, and these are an alternative, especially in the areas prone to atrophy, such as your eyelid, your perioral, your genital, your axillary, and inguinal. I think it is excellent uh, uh, medication for an eyelid dermatitis. We use it even for contact dermatitis. It is, uh, in terms of topical uh, cutaneous side effects for long-term use, it hasn't really been shown much uh, long-term side effects. Uh, however, you know that there is this black box warning for your uh, pimecrolimus and tacrolimus. Anti-inflammatory potency, your tacrolimus or 0.1% protopic, is about the potency of a mid intermediate strength corticosteroid. So your like your cutivate is an intermediate strength, is probably a same potency as 1.1% tacrolimus. And uh, this is more potent than your 1% pimecrolimus or elidel and your 0.03% uh, protopic. Again, the, the uh, calcineurin inhibitors has also been used for proactive treatment, and I will show you the data in the uh, next few slides. Mm -hmm. So when is it time for systemic therapies? When you see a moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, when you've tried all your topical agents and you still have not uh, been able to control the child's uh, uh, eczema and you have recurrent complications such as infection, think about uh, steroids. Well, actually, you don't think about steroids. The patient's usually sent to you already by the pediatrician who had like three courses of oral corticosteroids. And us, we know it's always associated with a dramatic rebound. So whenever they take them off steroids, they're back to uh, even worse. We know it's effective, but unfortunately, because of the rebound, you should not really be using it. Uh, I would say rever uh, Preserve it for crisis management if you absolutely have to, but I think it's more of how are you going to taper this child who was sent to you by the pediatrician who's already on oral corticosteroids, uh, and um, how are you going to intensify the skin care so that they now put them on a regimen for long-term maintenance. Cyclosporin uh, has very 
uh, rapid response, two to three weeks. Again, interesting uh, is that as the side effects of cyclosporine seem to be less in children than in adults, so that we're more afraid to use them in children, but the children actually tolerate uh, cyclosporine better than the adults. It has excellent or uh, good clearance. Uh, however, it's very limited duration. I tend to leave them for about six months to a year, but more than that, I get nervous. I need to switch them to something else, and that's usually either a cell sept or or make sure that I've intensified the topical treatment. Uh, you need to monitor your liver function, renal toxicity, blood pressure. There is a rebound in 50%, and about 10% with sustained remission over six months. Hopefully by then you have educated your patient on how to uh, intensify cutaneous care. Um, in terms of, as I said, uh, F, uh, safety, a one-year study in children showed uh, no significant difference between intermittent or continue, continuous treatment in terms of efficacy or safety. So if you stopped it, there's a rebound. There, uh, you can go back to cyclosporin. I gave three to five milligram per kilogram for six weeks, and then I tried to taper, as I said, about six months, and you add other therapies. This is a cyclosporine checklist that we use in the office. I mean, feel free to uh, use that as well. That's the, how we monitor our patients. Uh, mycophenolate uh, mofetil, which is self sept uh, it's a good four to six uh, week response and uh, less uh, side effects than uh, cyclosporine. However, it's also less effectivity. However, a better uh, side effect profile and there, I think there's a study that showed uh, shifting, initially putting the patient on cyclosporine, get them under control, and switching them over to cell step for a longer period of time. I told you about proactive treatment that uh, most of our patients are, are getting. Uh, this is a study showing 376 moderate to severe atopic dermatitis patients. They were initially stabilized with fluticasone cream or ointment, and they were maintained uh, uh, for two successive evenings weekly of your uh, topical corticosteroids. They used a cream or an ointment, and those who were put on the cream is 5.8 times less likely to have a flare, and those on an ointment is 1.9% less likely to have a flare. And you, uh, those of you who are uh, awake will realize why was the ointment less effective than the cream and the authors, ex when you expect that the ointment should be more effective than the cream and the, uh, the author's explanation is most likely a compliance issue, uh, less compliant with the ointment because, this, uh, because of the cosmetic uh, effect. Can, can you real quickly tell us the difference between an ointment and a cream? The difference between an ointment and a cream is that the ointment is oil-based and therefore there's really minimal water and there's minimal preservatives also in the ointment uh, because it's already thick. The cream is water with oil and therefore uh, it would uh, apply very much easier on the skin and would look much better. So there's more water in cream than in ointment. And in cream, the thing is to have to have more uh, uh, preservatives in a cream, and uh, the, the uh, to keep. Uh, and some people have to put antibiotics in there or antifungals in the cream for a longer shelf life. Ointments also, because they're ointment based, tend to be an equivalent cream and an equivalent ointment in terms of percentage. The ointment is actually more potent; ends up to be more potent. All right, the, this is now your patients on tacrolimus who had uh, a proactive treatment, meaning that they had uh, application of tacrolimus on previously involved. It looks like a normal skin now, but it previously involved skin that tends to flare. They would apply it twice a week. And you will see that the flare-free days is significantly less in patients who applied sacrolimus rather than the vehicle, and the, num the number of days of disease relapse is uh, much less in patients with uh, proactive treatment rather than those who just had a vehicle. Prevention, 
which is maternal avoidance, neonatal avoidance, breastfeeding, or stopping the atopic march. The, in 2008, there's um, a publication on the effects of early nutritional intervention and development of atopic disease. This was endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics and places the 2000 policy statement from the AAP. And I will just summarize it for you. Uh, you have your reference down here. So what about uh, maternal restrictions in pregnancy or lactation? There is no major role for maternal dietary uh, restrictions during pregnancy or lactation. Definitely a role in breastfeeding for at least four months. It prevents or delays atopic dermatitis, cow milk allergy, and wheezing in early childhood. There is modest evidence that the onset of atopic disease in infants at high risk of ATP and not exclusively breastfed could be delayed or prevented by the use of hydrolyzed formulas. And there's little evidence that delaying introduction of complementary foods between four to six months actually prevents atopic disease. So in summary, breastfeed for at least four months, and then you can uh, introduce your complementary foods. If you cannot breastfeed exclusively, then, ha then add a highly hydrolyzed formula. And uh, pregnant women need not restrict their diet. It doesn't uh, affect the development of atopic disease in the offspring. A few things on probiotics. Again, uh, unfortunately for all of these uh, subsequent slides, uh, there's really not much consensus and that's why I'm showing you the pros. Those are positive studies and negative studies. For probiotics, there's a meta-analysis with a moderate, moderate, modest role in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Um, there is more convincing evidence that it's better as a prevention in this if a child already has atopic dermatitis. Giving probiotics may not be as effective as when you give it before. Uh, the, the disease and uh, it seemed to be different with different formulas. It did not reduce the incidence nor out the incidence of nor alter the severity of atopic dermatitis. And the cocaine database uh, systemic review concluded that probiotics are not effective in treatment of eczema in children. So there may be some role in prevention, but there's really little um, role in terms of treatment. On the other hand, it carries a very small risk of adverse events, and it's, uh, a lot of uh, moms would like to give it to their children. Uh, there, there are very few side effects. Okay, vitamin D and atopic dermatitis. Um, again, we know that vitamin D, 48% of patients with asthma, atopic dermatitis, and or food allergy had insufficient or low levels of serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And so does vitamin D have a role in atopic dermatitis? Again, you have some positives, some negatives. Uh, there are lower frequency of atopic disease in children of mothers with higher intake of vitamin D. There's uh, atopic manifestations were more prevalent in the group with higher intake of D3. And there's significant improvement in baseline score in a study by Sid Brewery. What, does, what is the official um, uh, st uh, standing, though, is that there is a role of vitamin D in diseases other than a bone, um, uh, uh, the, I think it's called Institute of Medicine, has issued a statement saying that there is no role of vitamin D at this point beyond um, for, for bone. So larger trials are really ongoing. Immunotherapy, it's very interesting that the latest parameters on immunotherapy had this summary statement, and therefore I felt obligated to discuss it, is that there is some data now indicating that immunotherapy can be effective for atopic dermatitis when the condition is associated with aeroallergen sensitivity. So, and they quoted these four uh, studies that showed that um, uh, significant improvement in symptoms in patients who receive uh, subcutaneous immunotherapy. It looks uh, like it's a dose-dependent effect, specific, like for dust mites. There is some um, serologic and immunologic changes consistent with tolerance, 
and it seems to be better used in mild to moderate rather than severe disease. So that's, a, that's new, um, I mean, fairly new recommendations from the parameters. So that's just basically with dust mite allergy, isn't it? The, the, yes, the, it, lo it looks like the uh, more for dust mite al more effective for dust mite allergy, but most of the um, uh, atopic dermatitis children are really more of dust mite allergy. However, if you have exposed area, there's another subgroup where you have uh, children who whose atopic dermatitis who gets worse. For example, the seasonally in spring and fall and occur in the exposed areas of the body, in the face, in the arms during this period of time and are positive to uh, your environmental, your pollen, they may benefit from allergy immunotherapy. They have this specific distribution of and uh, history of exacerbation during uh, seasonally. Yeah, I was on the committee when they discussed that and, you know, in the past the, the bottom line was that it was, it would actually make eczema worse. So there was this fear that immunotherapy would flare the eczema and, so this is quite a change that, that it might actually be helpful. It's not something that I would necessarily treat if they had only eczema, but usually you're treating hay fever and asthma too, and eczema certainly wouldn't be a contraindication. It might actually be benefited from the immunotherapy. Yeah. So I, as I said, uh, it is new and uh, that it mm -hmm. became part of the parameters is uh, really uh, something new. Uh, what about amelizumab? Uh, we do see uh, some studies where, uh, but th th I think there's more conflicting studies for amelizumab in atopic dermatitis because the drawback is the fact that your atopic dermatitis children tend to have uh, IgE that are extremely high and not enough amelizumab. You cannot give enough an amelizumab to decrease at 3,000 to 7,000 uh, international units or KU of uh, uh, IgE. Uh, so um, one study shows there's a clinical benefit. However, as a monotherapy, uh, it doesn't seem to work. And another study showed that this benefit when added to usual therapy. Uh, looking at specific markers, um, none were found to identify any potential responders. And currently, it's there. Obviously, you know, there's no indication for amelizumab in atopic dermatitis, but maybe for your asthmatics who have atopic dermatitis as well, uh, with uh, IgE within a reasonable range, uh, might the atopic dermatitis might benefit. So I, w I would like to summarize the therapeutic principles and uh, recent approaches to the management of atopic dermatitis. Uh, still, proper hydration is number one. Moisturizers repair and preserve skin barrier. And the newest things maybe in this uh, arena is the development of improved skin barrier creams uh, and uh, wet wraps. Topical anti-inflammatory therapy can be used for both treatment of acute flares and prevention of relapses. And uh, we discussed about proactive treatment with topical corticosteroids or topical carcinoma inhibitors, putting them twice a week uh, on uh, normal looking but previously involved skin. Avoidance of proven foods and inhalants may prevent or lessen flares by early dietary interventions. Uh, breastfeeding, as we said, uh, is recommended up to four months. And if you can't exclusively breastfeed, is use hydrolyzed infant formulas. Decrease of microbial colonization can improve atopic dermatitis. And that's where you have bleach, bleach baths, antiseptics. Una boots and silver impregnated clothing. I didn't discuss this uh, simply because there tend to be one. Is the silver silver impregnated is a uh, little controversial, and the una boots I tried to prescribe it, but it's extremely extremely expensive, and really wet wraps are probably uh, uh, they are they are equivalent to wet wraps. Hmm. Addressing uh, psychosocial aspects of chronic relapsing illness and providing education with a written uh, skin care instruction can lead to improved outcomes. And I'll show you what you do, what we do uh, in the next slide. And what are the ongoing future studies that I discussed? You have your probiotics, you have your oral, vitamin D, amalizumab, and specific immunotherapy. 
So your treatment strategies for atopic dermatitis when you have the mild uh, hydration, decrease uh, itching, evaluate for food allergens, irritants, microorganisms, topical corticosteroids and calcineurin inhibitors. You move on to mid-potent, super-potent steroids, wet wrap star preparations, ultraviolet light. Uh, then we go on to as a rescue, oral corticosteroids, cyclosporin, PUVA, and hospitalization. This is what I'm saying is our action plan, which we give our patients. We circle this for them, and uh, they have. And mom has something uh, to work by every single day. Um, uh, it, it has helped uh, with compliance. It has helped us uh, change it every time they come if we need to change it, and uh, uh, it's very very specific. So I think that ends my, prepper, uh, my uh, presentation. I uh, hope all the kids that come looking like this, we can make them look like this. Yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, wouldn't it be nice? That was great. Thank you so much for Thank that. Thank you. Uh, for um, are there any comments or questions from the, from the audience? I have a quick question. Go, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Dr. Foss here. This is uh, Mark Sirota. I'm a second-year fellow here. I was wondering if you had any it's uh, using zinc replacement. I've had some experience with patients where we checked their zinc level and it was low, and I replaced their zinc, and and they had a significant. I'm, I'm sorry, please, please, you're breaking up. Say it again, oh. please. I was just asking about um, checking a zinc level and replacing replacing their zinc if it's deficient. I've had some experience doing that and having a really good response in their atopic dermatitis. I was wondering if you uh, did that as well, or if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, zinc, the, the, I'm repeating the question only because I have also fellows here who are joined us. Yes, zinc deficiency, actually that question came up last week with one of our, our children. Uh, zinc deficiency actually is more of the zinc deficiency giving, giving a rash that looks like atopic dermatitis. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, yes, replacing zinc in a patient with zinc deficiency will decrease the eczema, but it's more of not the zinc deficiency causing atopic dermatitis, but the zinc deficiency causing an eczema that looks like contact dermatitis. Mm. Okay. And I'm Kara Federally, one of the fellows. I had a quick question about um, proactive therapy. Do you do that for a specified amount of time or is it indefinitely, and what were the studies showing on that? So the question is how long do you keep uh, the proactive therapy? Uh, in Europe, uh, the proactive therapy is actually used indefinitely, and I indefinitely I mean for as long as the patient's willing to do it. It's not, you know, it's uh, uh, you would ha you know that the atopic dermatitis is uh, uh, flares, uh, remissions, and flares. Uh, most patients bid, would go on the pro proactive therapy, and when they get very good remission, would kind of slack, uh, and then they can go back on the proactive therapy again. But the studies, for example, in Europe uh, uh, show that it's like over a year of proactive therapy. Uh, side effects are minimal. Uh, still, I'm, I'm, I am still a little concerned about putting it for very long, so I still cycle my proactive therapy. In other words, uh, I, I I would put them on topical corticosteroids, for example, for six months or for four months using the proactive, and then I would use the topical carcinorum for proactive because I still feel that I will be able to decrease the side effect of topical corticosteroids if I cycle it. So I use both calcinorum inhibitor and topical corticosteroids at different times uh, to cycle the patient. Luz, this is Paul Dowling. Um, I have a question about the calcineurin inhibitors. And your your action plan for flare-ups of the eczema, you have both uh, the steroids and the calcineurin inhibitors listed. Do you usually combine those as like a step up, or how do you decide, because uh, of the black box warning, we kind of stopped using so much of those. Um, how do you decide to use the calcineurin inhibitors or add those on to the steroids? Okay, so the question is, uh, do you use both calcineurin inhibitors and topical corticosteroids? And uh, uh, 
how do you step up? Was that your other question, Paul? Yes. So I tend to depends on the location of the uh, rash in the face. I tend to use topical carcinoma inhibitors more again because of side effects of of it in the rest of the body. I tend to use uh, topical corticosteroids acutely because they're still more potent, and then I would go to topical carcinoma inhibitors, uh, especially in the uh, flexural areas where there's at, they tend to be more atrophy. Uh, I give patients like two or even three types of topical corticosteroids. So they have this very mild, I tell them, over-the-counter or aclovate, and they have this mid-potency, which is cutivate, and then they, they have this very high potency, which is the diproline. And so uh, the, the patients tend to be able to know which of the topical corticosteroids they would use for what type of reaction. Well, um, so, you know, you mentioned there was this black box warning, and, and there was a time when patients were being treated with the calcineurin inhibitors, and many of them doing quite well. Suddenly there was this black box warning. Everyone took their patients off, and then they cleared up again. And should we be concerned about that? And what, what, was, what is the story with that? I think the, the black box warning, as you know, uh, we actually had the uh, joint task force statement from the academy and the college on the black box warning that... Uh, uh, that there is a potential for increase of lymphoma. The black box warning is still there. I did review it like two years after, two years later, I think, Jay, it was in the annals where uh, the follow-up two years later did not really show an increase of uh, lymphoma. There is, they have not, the, the FDA had required a five-year follow-up of uh, the drug, but they the company has not resubmitted any of the data uh, uh, to show. I don't think they're going to try to go after taking off that black box warning anymore. Am I afraid to use it because of the black box warning? No, I'm not, uh, not at all. But the, the thing is, I am obligated to tell the patients that there is a black box warning, and so now there. Uh, they're more afraid rather than than me. Uh, again, as I said, I, I would explain to them that topical corticosteroids actually also has a potential of of, of malignancy, and uh, that was the, the statement in 2005 Joint Task Force that there is also a, a higher incidence than than control, and so uh, you you have choose between topical corticosteroids and calcineurin inhibitor. And I think cycling them like maybe a month on, a month or two months on ther topical corticosteroids and then 0.03% uh, uh, of tacrolimus might like uh, be a better option, both therapeutically and less side effects. So going back and forth might help. And I guess my final question is about itching. Uh, obviously, the most prominent symptom that the patients have is just this, this itch that just doesn't stop and they can't get away from it. We give antihistamines and sometimes they help, but then we have to push it so high that, uh, that, that they end up being sedated from it. Do you have any, any tips about what, how we can help them manage their itching? Yeah, so the question is really the itching associated with uh, uh, atopic dermatitis, which can really be very severe. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Jay, uh, the local the oral antihistamines really will work only to the point of sedation. Uh, so it's decrease the itching is uh, facilitated by the skin care. In other words, if you uh, put your topical corticosteroids, the itching actually uh, goes down. Uh, the, the cyclosporin in the patients on cyclosporin will tell you right away within the first like week that they're taking the cyclosporin that their itching is already markedly improved. Uh, so uh, it's something internal. I mean, I don't think it's something you can really be able to block with just the antihistamines. You need to do your 
topical corticosteroids and all your skin care and then your uh, systemic therapies to decrease that age. Well, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Luz Vanassier uh, is a professor of medicine uh, at uh, uh, Winthrop uh, University in uh, uh, Medical Center in Long Island, New York. Uh, good luck with the hurricane. I hope that you all uh, survive and have no uh, no harm. Stay safe, everyone. Uh, we're, that's all for today. Uh, join us on Monday, August 29th, when we will be uh, discussing the National uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines for asthma with Mike Boggs. And at 11 o'clock, Brock Williams will talk with us about in vitro ITE tests. In the meantime, this has been Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in the city. Have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences on Line Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.